They have been called the future of money, but cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin look to be in trouble. They're losing value and financial regulators are considering tighter controls. So can crypto make a comeback? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahalbara. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin have been some of the most popular investments during the past few years. They emerged a decade ago as an alternative to money, free from the control of governments and central banks. But now that's changing. At its peak last November, one Bitcoin was worth $67,000. Now it's down more than half to $31,000. Other digital currencies have also fallen sharply. Analysts say high inflation has made risky investments, including bitcoins, less attractive. And the cost of running cryptocurrency transactions has increased due to higher energy prices around the world. Developing countries have led the growth in digital currencies. Vietnam recorded the greatest cryptocurrency activity during the past year. It's followed by India and Pakistan, where peer-to-peer -peer transactions have risen. In Nigeria, crypto is the preferred way to trade, especially with China. The government in Abuja set new rules this year and even launched its own digital coin the year before. And cryptocurrencies are in demand in Afghanistan, a country in turmoil and among the poorest in the world, where it's hard to handle traditional money like the US dollar. Digital money is gaining popularity in Argentina. Researchers found it has the world's highest proportion of workers being paid in cryptocurrencies. Many buy bitcoins to protect themselves against an inflation rate of 50% and swings in the value of the country's currency, the peso. Crypt Station's goal is to make the use of cryptocurrency common in the real economy. In other words, nowadays is used as a method to save money due to inflation. But beyond that, we want to turn cryptocurrency into a daily life currency. Cryptocurrency is not based on the country's economy, so this benefits me quite a lot. Even if the local currency loses value, crypto is not based on the Argentinian peso, but dollars or euros, so I will always keep the same value. Let's bring in our guests in London, Naeem Aslam, Chief Market Analyst at Avatrade. In Rome, Brian Lucy, Professor of International Finance and Commodities at Trinity Business School and a former central banker. In Singapore, Zenon Capron, Director of Capronasia, a financial technology research and consulting firm focused on Asia. Welcome to the program. Naeem, according to The Economist, the market value of cryptocurrencies was almost $3 trillion in November. Then it fell to $2 trillion in April. Now it's at $1.2 trillion. Could this be the beginning of the end for the cryptocurrency? Thanks for having me. I think this is a bold statement because crypto is a different beast. It's a beast of its own kind. Because let's look at Bitcoin's price history over the last 10 years. One thing becomes very prominent. Bitcoin is capable of, re well, first of all, Bitcoin can retrace more than 50 to 75% of its value from its all time high. And it is capable of recovering those losses within quarters, if not months. In fact, we have a history of Bitcoin making new all time highs. Now, what investors and traders need to focus on when it comes to Bitcoin is mm -hmm. two important factors. From a price perspective, you look at the lows formed in each year. And if you look at the trend for the last number of 10 years, you see higher lows forming in each and every single year. So that gives a clear indication this is an upward trend. Number two is the adoptability. Are more institutions, hedge funds and regulators are saying yes, 
flat showing green flags to Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. As long as these two trends remain in place, I'm not concerned. Okay, Brian, many now are blaming central banks for what happened to the cryptocurrency, particularly when it comes to the tightening of monetary policy. Do you see it as a direct consequence of what was happening? Uh, no, I, I don't. And I think calling cryptocurrencies a currency is a misnomer. We have an experiment ongoing in El Salvador, where the government uh, made Bitcoin a, a legal tender. And the evidence from all research that I've seen, and there is some out there, is that the vast majority of people in El Salvador took the initial money that they were deposited into their electronic wallets and really haven't used it since. It's not being used as a currency in, in any meaningful sense. Uh, cryptos are a speculative asset class, and as such, they're perfectly okay as a speculative asset class. They're high risk and potentially higher reward. As uh, Naeem has mentioned, you do see these very large swings uh, as part of the, uh, the system. The reality is that as interest rates are rising, and they are going to be rising globally, two things are happening. One is we're going back to a more traditional uh, pre even global financial crisis, mm -hmm. monetary and fiscal environment. Secondly, we're going to see a situation where investors' risk appetites are going to be reduced. A large part, I believe, of the run-up in crypto prices and crypto attractiveness was because you have this wall of money seeking yield anywhere. And as a consequence, once that wall of money begins to recede, then the need to seek out ever more speculative, high-risk, high-reward asset classes, not just crypto, but other forms of assets, mm -hmm. will recede with it. Uh, as, a, uh, as a speculative asset class, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly reasonable. As a currency, it doesn't work. Okay, Zenon, why is cryptocurrency so popular in Asia, particularly in Vietnam? I think for many of the reasons that Brian mentioned, it's a speculative asset. And when you look at uh, you know the various jurisdictions across Asia, historically China, you know the run-ups in the, the stock market, heavily retail-driven, people see cryptocurrency and speculative asset classes as a way to make a lot of money, uh, whether that be real estate or the stock market or now cryptocurrency. And so I think a lot of investors or retail speculators are treating it like that. And, and so that's why we're seeing a lot of adoption. There is certain use cases though. I mean, when you're trying to move money around the world, there are a lot of fees involved in making transactions. And so cryptocurrency can see use cases, kind of these niche use cases in many of the emerging markets where oftentimes moving money cross-border is, is cheaper than using traditional currencies. And so I think, you know, outside of the speculative asset, there are some use cases, but as was hinted at before, in places like El Salvador, you know, spending on a day-to-day -day basis, we really don't see that adoption at this point. Mm -hmm. Naeem, I understand when you talk about the, the swings in the cycles of the, of the market and you say this is pretty much normal in a way or another and that the cryptocurrency remains resilient in the face of the downturn. But for a normal average citizen who would like to invest in cryptocurrency or contemplate that in the future, how can you explain to him that the algorithmic uh, stable coin, Terra for example, which stood at something like $50 billion and ended within a few weeks worthless. This is a new paradigm. Experiments are being done. Some of them are successful and some aren't. And unfortunately, Terra is an example of one of them. For investors who are interested in the cryptocurrency space, i.e. the speculative space, one should only invest what they are willing to lose just like any other investment thesis. And you should always look to hedge your risk against different asset classes. Now, you may be wondering, we are speaking of cryptocurrencies, why are you speaking of uh, different asset classes? You have to think from a traditional mind frame when it comes to cryptos, because within cryptos, you have different sectors, mm -hmm. just like how the S&P has different sectors. You have gaming, you have DeFi, you have crypto exchanges, you have cryptocurrencies, you have protocols, and you have Ethereum killers. 
as long as you are diversified against these particular sectors, which I've mentioned on your show a few times before, I think one should be okay or well positioned to take advantage uh, on this in this uh, speculative space. Mm -hmm. Brian, at the same time, you have the USDC, another stable coin, just because it is backed by cash and short data treasury bills. It doesn't seem to be really facing the same problems that the other cryptocurrencies are facing. Could this be an indication that trust oh, no. remains paramount when it came, comes to trading with cryptocurrency? Yes, the stable coins are an interesting situation because um, you've got basically two kinds of three kinds of stable coins. You've got ones which are fully or allegedly fully backed, although it's unclear the extent to which these are fully backed by um, dollars or, or you know near dollar equivalents. You've got ones that are backed by other commodities, including in some cases other cryptos, and you've got algorithmics. Now, the latter two cannot, under any circumstances, be considered stable. The first one, though, is part of the paradox of crypto, because in order for this crypto to be stable, it has to utilize fiat currency. And this goes to the fact that, it, as has been said, is a speculative asset class, not a currency. Why would you, however, put your money into a uh, dollar-backed crypto when you could put it into a dollar-backed bank, and when I say dollar, I use any fiat currency, which would be supervised and regulated and would have deposit insurance, et cetera. If tomorrow morning uh, a dollar-backed crypto stable currency was to evaporate, uh, basically the investors in it have lost everything. If a bank were to go into difficulties, there's usually deposit insurance, and we've seen that banks typically get heavily bailed out, and depositors are at the very last end of the queue for bail-ins. So the very success of these cryptocurrencies shows the roots of their failure uh, mm -hmm. as alternatives to currencies. As an asset class, as I think we've all agreed, they're perfectly fine. But the majority of the hype, certainly, around cryptocurrencies is not as an asset class. It's more around the fact that they will replace uh, fiat, that they're a hard currency, uh, that they're inflation-proof, et cetera. OK. Zenon, I mean... If I'm a member of the cryptocurrency community in a place like India, and I look at the market now, and then I know that the government doesn't like cryptocurrency, moving forward towards putting more restrictions, what, what kind of future do you see for the cryptocurrency in a place like India? Well, India, the story is really about the population. I mean, it's a, it's a massive, massive country and, and hasn't or is unable to crack down in the same way that China did on crypto. I mean, if you look at crypto in China up until five or six years ago, it was a thriving industry with, with many, many uh, companies focused on various different use cases from exchanges to payments to everything else. You know, India has a lot of that same potential, but the storyline is kind of the same. I and mean, the government is not in favor of crypto because it really doesn't see what it adds to the ecosystem, but rather only sees the risks that come out of having it there. So really they've come down hard. Uh, you know, more recently they've put a 30% tax on crypto investing and the legislation is kind of unclear about the future. So certainly the people in the crypto ecosystem in India are considering what their next steps are, mm -hmm. but this has been the status quo in India for a number of years now. So. You know, I think we'll see countries like India kind of continue to figure out the way with crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even certain countries like here in Singapore, we thought that they would be very pro-crypto and now they're pulling back a little bit. So it's very difficult to tell what the strategy or the trajectory of regulation mm -hmm. in, in any of these countries in Asia is. Naim, uh, I assume many in the past were drawn to the, into the cryptocurrency world because of the most established of all those cryptos, particularly Bitcoin. Now we lost 50% of its value, and the latest forecast suggests that it could fall to something like 8,000 compared to where it stood before just a year ago, which was something like 68,000. Well, how do you see it? Could it recover from that? Okay, <clears throat> before I answer your question, I just wanted to add um to what you were discussing before about the stable coins. And it is very, very important for investors to understand when it comes to stable coin, when that particular incident happened 
I literally locked myself for 48 hours in a room and read every single research paper and what was happening during that particular meltdown. And I've come, I came to a conclusion to one particular factor, which is called a bank run. This usually happens when there's so much instability in the system and people lose faith in a particular currency, whether it's a fiat currency, whether it's a digital currency, and they begin to withdraw. Manipulations within the dark world, which happen in Terra, they do take place in traditional markets as well, believe it or not. Not in the fiat currency space, but in other traditional markets, black world, where the market making takes place. To, to simplify things, mm -hmm. during the peak crisis, during the any financial crisis uh, within, uh, in Europe or anywhere else, we have regulators, we have central banks literally stepping in and limiting the amount of withdrawal that anyone can make on a daily basis. We've seen these examples of that increase happening. In stable coins, we do not have that mechanism because that erodes and goes against them, you know, that everything is centralized, things needs to be decentralized and stuff like that. The second thing what people really confuse about stable coins is that it's banked by a number of assets and there's no clarity. I'm not saying that is not true. I concur that is absolutely true what's, what's been said. How much clarity do we have mm -hmm. in relation to fiat currencies which are backed by whatever, government promises, right? Back in days, used to be backed by gold. Now, with, with, with just promises. Yes, now we have a more clarity in terms of tether. Although the questions are still out there, the companies which are providing the audit. But the main issue over here is a bank run, which is a control of how much money can be withdrawn on any single day. Okay. You know, if there is a panic today, you cannot withdraw that fund. All right. Brian, when the... Uh... European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde says that the Bitcoin and all the other cryptocurrencies were, are worth nothing. What is she trying to tell us here? She's trying to tell you that they have no fundamental value whatsoever, which is absolutely the case. So they are worthless, but not valueless. They're, they don't have a fundamental value. They don't give you a yield. They don't give you a return. You can't really spend them anywhere and you can't pay taxes with them, etc. So in, in some senses, they're a little bit like fiat currencies, except that you can lend fiat currency to people and they will give you an interest rate for it under normal circumstances. You can use fiat currency to pay your taxes, etc. They have no fundamental value. And uh, yeah, as a consequence, ahead. any value that they have is a value that is believed to be one that they will be able to accrue in the future. So in that sense, it's a little bit pyramidal. Uh, I believe cryptos have value because I believe that somebody else will believe in the future that they will have an increased value. And therefore, I will hold on to them. I will huddle, as they call it, hold on for dear life until I can get rid of them to, something else, to, to somebody else. In traditional financial markets, that's called the greater fool theory. Zenon, could the sell-off be an opportunity to get rid of the flawed uh, cryptos and the badly run companies that could regenerate a new phase for the for, for the market to rejuvenate to move forward yeah, I think you know the crypto industry is no stranger to these cycles I mean, if you look three or four years ago it was the ICOs or the initial coin offerings that were largely peddling business models that made no sense whatsoever. I think what the crypto industry over the past couple of years has has been able to take advantage of is the liquidity in the market. Uh, you know, this quantitative easing and the very cheap money that people had access to made it very easy to, for people to invest in cryptos and VCs to invest in companies, even if they didn't have the best business model. And, and certainly that's in many cases not limited to crypto. I think we're seeing that across venture capital now globally. Valuations are coming down. It's much more difficult for startups to raise capital. We're seeing that already, and it's probably going to get worse later in the year. It's kind of the same thing in crypto. You know, I think uh, investors will be a lot pickier about what they invest in. Although, you know, that being said, you still have organizations like A16Z, Anderson Horowitz, that are investing heavily in in some of these crypto spaces, whether it be in NFTs or metaverse or or otherwise. So it remains to be seen. But I don't think okay. uh, we're done with hurt. Certainly on this. I have a few different angles to cover with you, gentlemen. Uh, Naim, we're not talking about figures. We're not talking about stock markets. We're not talking about an industry. We're talking ultimately about 
lives and dreams that have been shattered over the last few weeks with a meltdown. People who were investing in the cryptocurrency and they saw their, uh, their savings wiped off. Do you think, because you spoke about the clarity and the transparency, that this is about time to rethink the whole disclosure procedure, the backing that these companies have, and what kind of assets they have for people to say, I trust that there is a backing for this company and that at the end of the day, I can, I can expect the returns and the yields. Briefly, if you don't mind. Sure. So I, I think there is there's a significant need for that particular mechanism to come into place uh, where regulators are providing their support or at least some sort of an assurance in addition to the disclosures. But at the end of the day, the responsibility lies with an investor. And investors should make mm -hmm. their own research what they're investing in. Brian, uh, are the cryptos paying the price for mirroring the stock market itself? Because when we saw how it all started, the central bank starting the, the uh, uh, quantitative easing, the uh, increasing of the... Uh, 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 of the interest rates, suddenly we saw the stock markets nose diving. Automatically, we saw the cryptocurrency following suit. Could 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 it be because of this correlation between both? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, there certainly is a correlation between broad market movements, particularly tech market movements, and cryptos. But if crypto is paying the price for anything, and investors are paying the price for anything, it's for investing in a bubble, and we know how bubbles end. They burst, and when they burst, they destroy a lot of wealth. And this has what has happened in the crypto market over the last while. Bubbles are endemic, and the nature of these markets is they are totally unregulated. That's their attraction, and that's their destruction. It, the only way in which you could have mm -hmm. a market which was not subject to these kinds of problems would be to have a market which was regulated and which was monitored. But that would be antithetical to what the crypto enthusiasts wish. Zenon, uh, is Asia bracing for a crypto winter? Certainly, I think that's what it looks like. I mean, Asia has become a big part of the crypto industry over the past couple of years, whether it be play to earn and metaverse. You know, there's a lot of money that's flowing into the region and there's a lot of kind of value that was created and has now been lost in cryptos growing in this. So. You know, Asia is uh, will face the same challenges that every other market does, if if not even more acutely, in certain markets that have invested heavily and have many startups that are focused on the space. Naim, we 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 we. we... We need to talk about the big Bitcoin miners, now widely seen as a culprit, blamed for what happened because they say that they used energy, uh, the, the use of the energy, particularly when it comes to their computers, to uh, to mint the and coin the cryptocurrency, is responsible for the meltdown. Not necessarily at all. Look at the latest headline today. Even in Nigeria, thermal energy is going to be used for mining. I think the efforts to continue to shift and move towards renewable energy source to mint uh, or, or to, to, to mint Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies are significant. And that is the only momentum that we are seeing where we sit. We'll have to leave it there. I really appreciate your insight, Naeem, Aslam, Brian, Lucy, Zenon, Capron. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story from me, Hashim Ahbara, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.